Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here. In this component of the lecture, we're going to be discussing neural language models. Now remember from part A of the lecture that we described some very simple techniques that we could use to generate word embeddings as a function of the context that the word appeared in. You may recall we had cat, dog, wolf, and lion. We went ahead and we counted up all the context that those words appeared in. We then put it through principal component analysis to find an equivalent vector space representation of those, and, and we were able to come up with uh, a beautiful matrix that said for each of the words, what was the vector that described that word. Okay, well, if you think about principal component analysis, it's great, right? But one of the limitations is that it forces us to have orthogonal basis vectors. That means that uh, whichever direction the x-axis is pointing, I'm required to have my y-axis pointing 90 degrees from the x-axis. And um, that constraint might make it so that we're unable to represent more complicated relationships in our data that don't neatly sort of fall along straight lines. Now, as you've known, hopefully by this point, Neural networks are very flexible functional approximators. And so the hope is that maybe we can use a neural network to learn a transformation of these very simple representations of our words into a vector space that's more nuanced, better able to capture uh, the complexities of language, and so on. OK, well, one of the very simple techniques that people use to represent words as points in vector space that is built on neural networks, at least partially, is a technique called word-to-vec. Now, you've probably heard about this. It's a very popular technique in the NLP community. There's really two instantiations of word-to-vec, or rather two ways of performing word-to-vec. And I'm going to introduce the two, but then we're going to speak in detail about one of them. The first of those techniques is what they refer to as the bag of words instantiation of word to vec This is where you basically take, um, as the input to the model, you have a set of words that are neighboring words to some target. So let me sort of step you through this to make it clear. Let's assume we have the sentence, the cat sat on the floor. In this case, what you do is you take the cat and you put it as uh, an input to your, your model. You have on floor, you put it as an input to the model, and you're trying to predict this word sat. So you're basically trying to say, given these inputs, some representation of the cat and on floor, I want to predict the probability that the middle word is sat. Okay, so you're trying to figure out basically how to use the context. That's what this stuff on the left here is, this context. Um, to, to predict this word here, okay? And what word to vec does is if it can figure out a way to map from the context to the output vector here, basically something in the middle here has to be responsible for performing that transformation and, and we can take advantage of the properties of that transformer to, to uh, represent then a given word as a vector. Okay, the second version or instantiation of word to vec is basically an inverted version of the bag of words that they call skip grams. That's where instead of taking a bunch of context words and using it to present or predict a target, you're using a target word, in this case sat, and you're using it to predict the context. I'd like to explain one of these two instantiations to you, and then you're more than welcome to go and read through the original paper or several online tutorials that sort of speak about word to vec if you're curious about the other. The instantiation I will be speaking about is the bag of words, also called SIBO. And the first step if you want to implement the word to vec model is you take each of the individual words in your vocabulary and you encode them using something called one hot coding. This is where you basically have a vocabulary of words, and then you say, what's the index of cat in that vocabulary? And so, for example, it might be 0, 1, and then a bunch of zeros. And 
Uh, similarly, for the other input that you're going to you're going to put into the other part of the context that you're going to put into your model, let's say it's the word on because it's cat sat on. Um, for the other part of the context, we're similarly going to one hot code it. So let's say that the index of on in your vocabulary, let's say it's the fourth word, so you come here and you put a, a one in the, um, the the fourth location, and then every, everything else is zeros. Okay, so this is how you handle the input. You basically one hot encode your context. Um, and then for, for the output data, the target that you're trying to predict, this is also a one hot encoded vector, but for the target word. So in this case, it's sat because the, the data that we used was cat sat on. And so you know the input is these two pieces of context and the output is again, this, this middle word. Okay, now the goal of this neural network is to find a mapping from these input layer representations, so this vector here, to this output layer representation here. Okay, and the way it's going to do that is exactly as we saw in the last module. You're going to keep tuning the weights of this weights matrix W, V, N, and W prime NV so that you can come up with a mapping that converts the V dimensional input vector to an N dimensional vector. This is the vector representation of, of this word. And then you're going to use this N dimensional representation to try to reconstruct this output. Okay. In this process, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to embed the word sat in a vector space location that is informed or controlled by the contexts in which the word sat showed up. Cat and on is one of the contexts. Of course, in any real training set, you'd have more than one context that uh, you would use when you're training the model. Okay, so the first step that you would do is you need to take your uh, W uh, matrix, which is V by N, let's say, and you're gonna pass the input vector in through that matrix using uh, W transpose times uh, X, and you're going to compute a vector representation of cat. Now remember these initial weights in this matrix, they're probably going to be randomly initialized, okay? And we're gonna use gradient descent to optimize them based on, on the, the performance of the model, just like we would in any other approach. Okay, but here what we're doing is we're first taking this part of the context cat, we're passing it through the W matrix and we're getting, um, we're getting a vector V cat. And then we take the other part of the context, in this case it's the word on, and we also pass this through um, the matrix to transform it to its vector representation, V on. And then we use the average of those context vectors as the input to another set of linear functions, which are parameterized by W prime and V. So these two together give us V hat, and then we can multiply this V hat by uh, w and v to try to recreate this vector out here. Okay, well, when we want to we want to recreate this vector out here, notice that the output was uh, zeros and ones, so we need a sigmoid, right? And you may recall from one of the earlier lectures that the multi-class version of a sigmoid or a logistic regression is accomplished through something called a softmax. And so we basically take the output of this W prime, we multiply it by our vector V. This transforms it into uh, a representation that when passed through soft masks effectively gives us the probability of the outcome class that we're interested in. So in this case, if we had done a good job, um, the probability of, of sat would be high given the context cat and on. Okay, notice that um, in this representation for word to vec that the hidden layer nodes are not necessarily normalized with a sigmoid before being passed. That is, we come up with one uh, transformation here. This is just a linear transformation, right, as a function of this input vector. And 
we sum that uh, transformation to create the vector v, which we then, without doing any sigmoid kind of transformation on it, we just pass it to another set of linear transformations before finally performing the softmax out at the end. Okay, I want to make that clear because a lot of neural network topologies, including this one for word devec, will not always use um, activation functions everywhere. Sometimes they don't include an activation function or they don't sort of squish things between a, uh, a range of values that um, because they don't feel that they need to or they want to save on sort of computational efficiency or there's a whole variety of, of reasons why you might not want to do that. I'm just bringing this to your attention because this happens to be the way that it occurs in word to vec and if you read other papers about neural networks and you see that they don't include an activation function, I don't want you to get confused by that. Okay, so let's say that we've gone through this whole process together. You know, we ran many different sort of forms of uh, uh, input contexts with, with output contexts, and we did gradient descent at each of those different training points, and we found the optimal value of WVN uh, here and uh, w prime nv. Well, this is great, right? Because now if I want to find the vector representation of a new word, like for example, this was the vector representation of sat, I can use this, a multiplication of this and my w prime vector to find the value of v hat. Or I could also come from this direction, right? And I could, I could take the, uh, the vector for for sat, but passed in through the w vector and get the value of v hat. You can actually do it using either of these two matrices insofar as you finally are able to reverse your way into this value of v hat. Okay, so the last point that I want to make here um, is that the softmax function that you're seeing here in the word to vec implementation is technically a hierarchical softmax. For practical purposes, what this means is that you're only backpropagating the effects of the word that you're trying to predict when updating the weights. So because there's many different sort of outcome classes here, right? You could imagine that you could, for each of these, backpropagate and update w uh, and w prime. Practically, what you do is, when you're using hierarchical softmax, is you say, I'm only going to update the weights for this um, this location uh, because this is the only place it was one.